<laughs> Welcome to We Don't Owe You Shit. Today, we are having a special Black Seahorse Dad panel. And we are going to start with some Brooklyn Cage. We are going to start with some introductions. So we're going to start with you, Tanias. Go ahead and introduce yourself. So what we're looking for is your name, age, pronouns, where you're from, how many children you got, and the ages of your kids. And if you want to divulge his, his name, you can do so as well. Divulge whose name? Say again? You said whose name? Divulge whose name? Your child's name. Oh, okay. Anyway, hey, I'm Tanias. I'm 32. I go by who? He, him, King, and God. I uh, <laughs> have four kids. I only have one biological child, but I have four kids. Two of them are 18. Elijah will be 13 this month, well, July. And Zizi, Zanias, is the only biological one I've had. But the rest are mine. Okay. Thank you. And Mari? Yeah, I'm Jamari. I'll go by Mari or Miguel, either or. I'm 29 years old. Uh, I currently live in New York City, but I'm originally from Virginia. I have two kids. One is 18 months, soon to be in a few days. The other one is 23 weeks, currently baking. And Zach and y'all have to wait for the name reveal. <laughs> so uh, what Mari is saying without saying is that he is uh, currently pregnant and uh, with baby number two. So congrats on that. Is my Gosh. Mike too much in the way? Okay. Y'all know, know this is a podcast. Okay. Um, and I'm Caden Coleman. I am 36 years old. I'll be 37 in a few weeks. Um, I am, my pronouns are he, him. I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, I have two kids. I have a nine-year-old Azalea and a two-year-old, going on three-year-old journey. And yeah, so that's me. I ain't having no more kids, so don't look for that. <laughs> All right, so first question I'm going to ask you, Mari, um, how was it finding out that you were pregnant? Uh, my first, first pregnancy? and second time. Um, the, both of them was definitely not planned. Um, the first time I was really like shocked because um, I've I been see. off of testosterone for like two years, but I still did not have like a, a cycle, menstrual cycle. I think that was because of I had an irregular one, like I was born with. So that was really shocking. Um, I, I was kind of scared because I didn't really know like seahorse dads only knew you. And I know it was probably like difficult for you and stuff like that, like certain times, like, you know, when you was talking about your experience with the birth in the hospital. So I was like really nervous. Um, my second time, I took it pretty much better. I feel like I was still getting to know myself in a sense. Like, um, my first pregnancy just made me like, accept the trans because I love the stealth lifestyle. So I really accepted both part of me. I, my first transition, like when I first transitioned, I actually like X out the person that I was before and I started a new life. But um, all in all good, you know, accepting myself, loving myself, every part of myself. Love that. And for those who don't know, uh, when Mari's talking about stealth, Stealth is, when we're talking about the trans community, we're talking about only the important people in our lives know uh, that we are trans, but in our everyday life, um, we're walking around as, for us, it's assumed uh, men, and for trans women, it's assumed women. Uh, most people live stealth for uh, safety reasons, um, and yeah. And, when, and um, I just want to point out that I was the one of the first people that Mari told the first time. And if you watched our last podcast together, he lied to me the first time and told me that he was like asking for a friend. Hey, I just found out my friend was pregnant. What does he do? And then he waited a few weeks and was like, oh, yeah, it was actually me. So I just wanted to point that part out. And then I was one of the first person he told the second time, too. And I was like, again? 
Like, I don't have two kids. Like, what? Anyway, uh, what about you tonight? How was it finding out for you? When I found out I was pregnant, it was like a, oh, shit type of thing. Because one, not too many people knew I dealt with men anyways. So now here it is saying that, one, I'm pregnant. Two, it's not just females I'm dealing with. And I do deal with men. So it's like, damn, because at that, at the beginning of my pregnancy, I was really big on how people viewed me. I was always living up to how society, like, viewed me big, big, big time. Like, so it was like, damn, how am I going to go about telling everybody, like, and not have to get, like, that backlash or whatever, or people I'll be like, ugh, you sneaking dick and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Yeah, really, really like, damn, how am I? And then, plus at work, nobody knew that I was trans. I was working with a whole bunch of men. So it's like, damn, they're telling me that I can't work. So now I've got to go to work, let them know, like, hey, this is my doctor's note. I, I, I can't go to work. So now I'm pretty much out of my own room. So I had to deal with a lot of people wondering, like, so you was really a woman, blase, blase. Like I had a whole mm-hmm. like coming yeah. with my pregnancy, and then it was just like I'm just now moving into my place. I'm just now moving to Florida, getting on my feet, and now here I'm here. So I can't work because it's unsafe, and I didn't have a car. Like I was just really just starting off. So it's like, damn, what am I gonna do? Type of thing. Right. So it, it was a lot of hell when it came to the beginning of my pregnancy, for real. Right. Question for both of y'all: How far along were you when you found out? I was going on four months, so at like eight, nine weeks, like nine, like yeah, eight weeks, eight weeks and some days, yeah. I was okay. three. Months. What about and with the second one? The second one I knew quicker, but I got it confirmed around like the third month. Gotcha. So like twelve, twelve. So you kind of your body kind of knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about yeah. you, guys? I was three months ramping up to the four month mark when I found out. Get back in the camera. It's like a you just started gravitating over there. Um, because- for me, um, I found out that I was pregnant the first time when I was five and a half months. Um, after a lot of after a lot of doctor's visits, and I knew something was wrong. But you know, we're all told, and I'm sure you can all agree that we're all told that after you've been on testosterone for a certain amount of time, you're not going to get pregnant. Like you're good. Like you don't really have to worry about it. So that's where I was. And so I didn't, nobody, even my doctors thought to check to see if I was pregnant. I was in and out of the hospital. I mean, not the hospital, the doctor's office. They checked for diabetes, diabetes, all types of stuff. I'm I'm getting fat and I'm trying, I'm, I'm in the gym and I'm like, what is going on? Found out I was pregnant in five and a half months. Like my my experience kind of mir- mirrors Mari's, where the second one, your body just knows. I was like, I'm really tired. <laughs> What's going uh-huh. on here? And uh-huh. I was like, I'm just gonna check to see if I'm pregnant. And lo and behold, I did find out I was like seven weeks um, the second time the journey. Um, uh-huh. I, found out I was pregnant. Um, okay, so that leads into the next question. So now you found out you're pregnant. Uh, you got to go to the doctor and all that stuff. How were you treated uh, by your by your medical providers, nurses, uh, everybody in the in the medical spaces? How were you treated? Were you ever misgendered? Did you ever get told that you weren't supposed to be there or anything like that? Who you want to go first? Uh, tonight's. Let's go with tonight's. Um, I was their first trans patient, and I feel like they're like going up overboard a little bit like they got their pronouns all down and all that but they're like making sure that i was like extra comfortable and all that i, was, I feel like they're just a little too much overboard it's like how are you <laughs> prefer that uh make sure and then I, as i'm walking in hey he goes by he him like they're extra loud about it like making sure that everybody was on board he goes by he him their father because I disclosed to them when I called them, because I called kind of multiple doctors, letting them know, like, hey, I'm a trans man or whatever. And I'm looking for an OBGYN or whatever. But I am a trans man. I go by he, him pronouns. Are you trans? So, I mean, I disclosed all that. So they knew who I was coming into the appointment. But I just feel like they're just a little too much. Way too much. But, I mean, I was comfortable to a certain extent. But it's like, y'all don't have to be all extra about it. Like, I'm <laughs> just like y'all are human beings. Just yeah. as Makes sense. What about you, Mari? I got VIP treatment 
um, for Zach as well. Um, they was very respectful. Um, I had like, it was a great experience. Zach was a great experience, even down to the delivery. They also, before the delivery, my OB um, had a meeting with her team, with the head nurse to let them know. So it was no surprises. Um, I had like three different social workers and stuff like that for like job, you know, um, <clears throat> for like work and stuff like that. So I never really had to sit really too long in the waiting room. They would just bring me to the back to wait for the OB to come in. Second experience, no. Um, I have to really? still have the same OB, but I wanted to keep her because we actually still we communicate still as well. She always check in. I'm actually her first trans patient too. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so she does like multiple hospitals. So now the government has her at the Ryan Health Center. And I really hate going to that place because they're just now starting to get educated about like transgender. Like, and I really felt like really uncomfortable, especially like by those, I don't want to like, I buy certain women and I just remember like I had a terrible experience when I had to get my blood drawn for to check the um, translucent on the back of the baby neck like eight weeks and this lady like she talked to me like she didn't ask me about the pregnancy at all she just started talking to me about um trans um not trans just gay men patients that she had that was positive and I really felt that was really profiled, and I just I took it to a whole lot of whole level. I talked to the director; it's definitely noted in her profile and stuff like that. So uh, that's why that's I crazy. Think. So what you were at, you were at where for the first one, where you got that um, treatment? Um, Mount Sinai. Okay, West. So I just want to throw that. I want that to be known so that you know people in New York know. That that's a good place to go to. And the second place is what? Ryan Health Center is in Harlem or Amsterdam. Do not like that place. Okay. So with the delivery part, because I didn't I didn't really go to the delivery part. The delivery part, like all the way up until the delivery was great. But when it came to delivery, that's when we came up to the hiccup. Because that's when they falsified my documents and that I had fentanyl in my system, opened up a CPA case and doing all that. Like were anti-trans big time. Like they were adamant about taking him. They said that he had fentanyl in his system, I had fentanyl in my system, but we had no withdrawal, so I had a CPS for the first two months of me having ZZ. Like they're at my house every single day, UA and me doing random UA. Like I had to make sure I had somebody at my house 24 hours of the day after I had ZZ for two whole months, just off of them saying I have fentanyl in my system. Like they were adamant about taking but that was like the only like problem when it came to the whole hospital state delivery and all that. But before that, it was good. After that, it was yes. And I know it was only because I was trained. Yeah. And I mean, you're in Florida, so that doesn't shock me. Yeah. You know, that doesn't shock me at all. Um, for me, um, the, and I, I, and you know, I think it's important to note that like, <clears throat> to say like, that's the only problem, that is a huge problem. And I think that like, because we're trans and we're black and we've gone and we were, you know, uh, socialized as women and stuff like that, we're so used to trauma that like, as long as it's been okay <laughs> up until a certain point, it's kind of like, oh, that's the only thing we went through. But like, liter literally, they were trying to take your child. Like, that's not like a, oh, that's the only thing that happened. But we're so kind of like, like, we're kind of like uh, programmed to be like, oh, it was just that, um, which is kind of how I got through my pregnancies uh, because both of my pregnancies, I was the first um, trans man, uh, pregnant trans man to come in to both because I was pregnant in both Philly and New York, uh, six years apart. And I was hoping it was going to be different, but it wasn't. I was blatantly misgendered. I was offered multiple abortions. They just kept offering me abortions. I remember with Journey, they offered me an abortion at six months. And I was like, is this like a normal practice? All because I have a sickle cell trait, right? They were like, oh, we just wanted to make sure you didn't want to get an abortion. And I'm like, I've never mentioned an abortion. So why do you keep bringing it up, right? Um, at the hospital, 
Um, I was misgendered by nurses. I had one lady who was so afraid to take my blood that she was literally shaking. And before she got a chance to, to take the blood, I literally called and I was like, get who the fuck up out of here. Like, get her out of here. Are you sure, Mr. Coleman? I'm positive. Get her up out of here. If I make her that nervous, she needs to not be here. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I think the people always ask me, well, how did you get through that? And for me, it's like, I'm just so used to it that it's something that I just shrug off, right? And just kind of like bury. But these are traumatic experiences and these are why these conversations need to happen. Because when you hear about the conversations about um, white trans men, and this is called We Don't Owe You Shit for a Reason, so I'm not about to mince words. When you hear about white trans men, their experiences are always so great. They have at-home water births and their insurance covered their doulas and their midwives and their primary care physician was also, it was like, well, damn, <laughs> what are these resources for me, you know? Um, right. And I think that's why it's important to have these conversations. Uh, going into the next question, um, this was a question that was actually submitted by a few of my followers. Um, is for you, Mari, and for us was, it hard to keep confidence as in confidence within your individual gender identity during pregnancy? Like, did you ever have any moments where you were feeling insecure in your manhood or anything like that during pregnancy? Mari I just feel like, uh, yeah, I feel like pregnancy, um, it comes with that. Definitely as a trans man, it is probably like 10 times harder because your body is going through this growing state. Even though you love it, you it's kind of like a, for me, it's kind of like a sour patch type of thing. Um, your body's doing something amazing, but it's up the cost for your mental and, you know, body is for I suffer with, um, with like phobia of like, um, gosh, I'm, I'm being really personal with y'all, very vulnerable, but, um, I do suffer with like weight and stuff like that in a sense. So that's why I push myself like 10 times, like really hard and like the gym and stuff like that. So, yeah, but, um, it is, um, and still, I still do kind of like suffer a little bit, like with like confidence because like, um, I don't feel like I can ever be like a hundred percent confident walking around with a pregnant belly and I'm showing like more so it's just really like I think it's I can just like you know society even though like I feel like I'm better than what I was mm -hmm. I still was like working on myself if that makes sense that's good uh what about you tonight um in the beginning big time mm -hmm. just because again I was always worried how others felt and viewed me or whatever and it's I I was or more so, it, it didn't bother me with the belly, but it's just the whole top area because prior to having, I didn't need top surgery or nothing like that. So it's like, I was really big in my head, like, these aren't going to go away. The belly's going to go away, but I know the top is not going to go away. And I wear form-fitting clothes. I don't like the baggy fit, no nothing like that. So I've started getting bigger clothes because I'm always in my head about the top half. I mean, it's gotten a little bit easier just because I'm eligible to feed him and whatnot, and I He's been able to like progress and he's held all that. So I mean, it made it easier, but there's still days like I, it takes me so long to get dressed and leave my house now just because it's like, damn, they see it. And then I take pictures. That's why I don't have that many pictures of myself now. I delete them. Right when I see my top, like my eyes automatically go to my top and it's like, damn, I'm sitting there with a whole top chest now. Like it bothers me big time. Like I hate looking at myself big time, but it takes me four or five outfits before I leave my house. Like there's sometimes I don't even leave my house to be totally honest with y'all. Like I don't even tell people that like, I stay at my house because one, my son is and one thing I refuse to do is feed him out in public because I like I ain't even gonna hold y'all. Like I go to the bathroom so I don't have to have any for anybody looking at me. Like I, I battle within myself big time and it's like it's real hard. It's damn near 18 months and I still struggle with it. And I know there's cis men out here that's got bigger titties than I do, but it's still just <laughs> mental thing yeah. in yeah. Real, yeah. Real, real yeah and i mean and also being trans you're under a microscope 
people are always looking for reasons to misgender you or reasons to disrespect you. So um, I can definitely understand that. Um, for me, I'll be honest, I really didn't have very much dysphoria or lack of confidence uh, with the outside world when it came to me being pregnant. I think because I'm already fat, <laughs> it was like, I just looked like I had a big old stomach. Like I had to try to convince people that I was pregnant. I had more frustration trying to convince people that I was pregnant than not, right? Um, where I did have insecurities was where it was in my interpersonal relationships. And because I'm gay um, and I date gay men, gay cisgender men for the most part, um, pregnancy is seen as such a female thing. It's something for women. So I was in my head a lot about whether or not I would be still seen as a man or treated like a man, or you know, if I was somehow less desirable desirable because I my body's going through this female thing. Um, that was my biggest insecurity, just how my partners were seeing me in the moment. Um, I I've never really cared about kind of like my uh, how it was outside, which brings me to the next question, Tanias. Um, how did you navigate being pregnant outside of what is considered to be normal? <laughs> so out, being a trans man, how did you navigate it? Like what were some ways that you went about making yourself feel comfortable while pregnant as a man? I started sharing my journey on social media. And being that I was eligible, like I'll get a massive amount of like inboxes, like saying how I'm helping them by posting and all that. And I feel like that's what helped my mental big time is seeing that I'm eligible to help others, educate others on something they knew nothing about. Because a lot of people, when I first started posting, they're under the impression that we transition and off top, we, we don't ever want to be pregnant. You know, that that's just a womanly thing. So just seeing that I was eligible to educate other people within the how trans other trans individuals work or whatnot. That's what made it a little bit easier to just navigate the, through the whole pregnancy because I've seen that a lot of people were misinformed about the whole trans. I mean, I was myself just because I'm like I didn't. I've never seen any trans besides you. You're the only trans individual that I've seen oh. carry a baby. I thought it was just absurd to be trans and pregnant. Like that's just. Right. A like, I was within myself thinking, like, you cannot be trans and pregnant. Like, I ain't even gonna hold you, Caden. Like, I was very judgmental about it. Like, why would you transition to carry a baby? I was one of them people who mm -hmm. I carry a baby. Like, that makes zero sense. You transition to be a male, live up to the expectations that a male should be. Until I carried my own baby, like, damn. I was that, that individual that would judge when, now that my feet are in those shoes, it's like, let me go <laughs> share. Because yeah. maybe not will stop feeling and thinking that we should be up, living up to these expectations. Yes, exactly. That's well, how it helped out, honestly. But I yes. was that in for judging. I ain't even gonna hold you. I was. And life, and life will humble yeah. you every single time. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Like, uh. platform, I was very judgmental until yeah. now I'm in that predicament. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad I've seen your platform. And that's why it's so important that people understand, like, until you can put yourself in somebody's shoes, you shouldn't be judging because you never, oh. never know what it's like. And so, you know, I, this is why this kind of panel is so important. Uh, Mari, I know for you, with your, um, with your first pregnancy, you basically stayed inside. Like, so right. how... Has how did you navigate which you know the parts that you did navigate and like what is different now? Um and okay, so basically like solitude, it was probably like the worst. Um I was going through like um again, like um I was battling inside that you you supposed to be this man, but you're carrying a child. So I uh, you know, like I was battling in between myself. I never judged another trans man or had any type of judgment to anybody else that was trans. You know, that's your life. You go about it, whatever, you know. Um, and I, um, just all in all, I was like, why should I be ashamed of me bringing life into this world? Like, this is my journey. Everybody's life is different. 
um, and just just love yours, you know. So it just brought me to like realization of myself and just you know accepting everything because I never wanted to be trans. I wanted to like, but even as a trans man, you can never fully transition to be a cis man. You went through that whole puberty and just how you was birthed, you know. So yeah. your journey is going to always be totally different. I had to really understand that for myself. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I'll go about the world and stuff like that. I still be having my days and stuff. I think that's just human. Yeah. But I'm out there, y'all. Like, yeah. seeing y'all pages, especially like Kaden, like, like, it just, it feels so much better to have a community. And also, you know, you just get so much love and support and people asking you questions. It feels good to educate people and just... You know, because why we have, you know, if you choose to do that, that's your life. Right. It doesn't make you less of a man, you know. Right. Um, for me, um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that when I first found out I was pregnant with Azalea, I told my ex-husband, I said, well, I guess I'm being in the house for the rest of this pregnancy because I'm not going outside. <laughs> like, so that's not happening. Like, I'm not going outside. So we just going to have to figure this out. Um, and I'll never forget, I enrolled in school and this was before I really started like showing, showing. And I remember mm-hmm. I was taking an evening class and I was sitting in my car and I was, I don't know really what hit me, but I was just like, no, I'm not. Like, I really started thinking about my life and like what it took for me to accept that I was a transgender person in the first place and what it took for me to come out as trans. And then after that, what it took for me to come out as gay. And I was like, am I really gonna let society put me in the house? Absolutely not. And that's when I picked up my phone and I recorded my first YouTube video um, talking about my pregnancy. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be open about this because there has to be somebody else that is going through this or thinking about going through this or whatever. And for me, it was never about going viral. I didn't care about any of that. It was just, to me, it was the same as people documenting their transition. You know, I'm three weeks on T, you know, that kind of thing. It was just me kind of like documenting pregnancy from a different lens. You know, I never expected a platform. I never looked for one. Um, And it just kind of went from there. And from that moment, I decided that I was just going to do what I needed to do unapologetically and, you know, while still paying attention to my safety, of course, because I'm not going to say I never walked outside and and felt unsafe. I mean, I did, especially with Journey, because say I was, uh, um, it was a winter pregnancy. So I was in hoodies and sweats, right? Um, With Journey, I was in New York City and it's hot here in summer in New York City. So I'm in tank tank tops and hoochie daddy shorts, pregnant. Like pregnant, I guess I, I think I kind of lucked out in a sense because it was COVID, so there weren't that many people outside. But there were moments where I felt, you know, uncomfortable because you'd never know how people are going to respond to you to you being trans and pregnant, you know. Right. So, um, going back to like the medical side of things, do you feel as though all of your needs were met medically, and if they weren't, where did they fall short? Like, what would you change? Um, I feel like my needs weren't met when it came to, like, the lactation consultants. Because mm. I was trying to get any kind of information about, like, what do I need to do? Because I couldn't produce for the first, like, mm. almost two months. And I feel like if I actually had that lactation consultant that wasn't judging. Because right mm-hmm. when I came, just frown their face up and I could hear them talking shit. Like, so I just won't walk out. But I feel like... <laughs> they were to not be able to get actually just like accept me and help me like they're helping everybody else. I probably would have produced a lot sooner and it wouldn't have been as stressful, but I went through hell just to be able to produce anything. Like, thank God the TikTok, I was able, able to get that help. But when it came to like that one-on-one learning how to pump and what, what am I needing to do? And like, what am I doing wrong? Like, I didn't have that for a while, right. forever. It like, one day I just broke down and came to TikTok like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to produce. What do I do? I can't get a lactation consultant to help me to save my life. And yeah. then I had plenty of people out, but it took me going to TikTok to finally gain that help because I didn't have it out here. 
That's so sad. That is so that, that like, and it's like the fact that people will allow who you are to deter them from helping you feed a baby. <laughs> like that has nothing to do with you or how they see you or anything. And like, why? Like for what? Uh, I thought you go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ask and all that. Like I put a hat on, put a mask on, all that. Like and then just go in, and they still weren't helping me at all because then they knew me from TikTok. They're oh, like, oh, you're the trans man from TikTok. So even me covering up and acting that and going in saying I'm his mom, like I did that just to see if I can get some flipping help because at that point I was just at my wits end, just stressed out. Like I, I, I even went to the lowest of lows just so I could finally get help. And that's you had to misgender yourself trying to get help. Like that's crazy. I was like determined because I went to a million different WalMarts trying to find this formula, and every time I would find the formula, it didn't sit well with him. Like he was just going through it. And yeah. I went to three different formulas. It wasn't sitting with him right. He was losing weight. Like maybe I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> right. But it was that's crazy. Mm. What about you, Mari? Was there anything uh, lacking for you, or that you would change? I would say, like, maybe, like, two extra days in the hospital. I was in the hospital for, like, five days. I ended up losing a lot of blood. So they ended up giving me um, iron through the IV. But also, Zach had um, belly rubin, and he had to go right underneath the light and stuff like that because we do not have the same type of blood. Mm. So um, that was a whole fiasco. And just to go through that didn't, you know, they release you and then you're – you're worrying about your child for your child to have to go back to a hospital and stay in the hospital like 24 hours. And it was just, that was a lot. Yeah. So, um, um yeah, that I, I, I was lucky in the sense I didn't have to have my kids any, either one of my kids stay in the hospital, um, afterwards, but I just, I couldn't even imagine you go into this hospital, give birth and leave and go home and your baby your baby ain't with you. Um, for me, um, I would change just about everything. Um, I feel like I spent most of my pregnancy educating people and um, therefore I wasn't getting any education, um, especially with Azalea because that's my first child. I wasn't planning on having a child. I wasn't thinking about having a child. So I wasn't educating myself on having children, you know? And I spent so much time trying to advocate for myself that I never really got to experience pregnancy. Like I was pregnant, but I never really got a chance to experience pregnancy. And even during my labor, um, I was in labor for, they were trying to induce me for five days. And I had to, I had to have a nervous breakdown and threaten to cut her out myself for them to give me the C-section that I requested when I first got in there. So like my postpartum, um, uh, was super difficult. And so that brings me to my next question, which I know we all three have pretty good <laughs> postpartum stories. So let's talk about postpartum, uh, Mari, you'll go first and then, uh, tonight's. Um, my postpartum, it was like, um, um, I had like this attachment, like, I guess just by like him having to go back to the hospital and stuff like that. Um, I used to wake up in the middle of the night to make sure that he was breathing and just like, I always, I didn't really want anybody to hold him at all. Um, I really neglected myself. Um, it's just like, I, it's sometimes you, it's so easy. You can fall into this, that you just put everything into your child and you don't do anything for yourself. <laughs> so it took like, like I say, it took like a little bit after three months for me to actually just go out for like a walk. Cause I was just really in the house, but cute. It was, it was the winter time. It was like brick December. So mm -hmm. it was like, um, that, but, um, postpartum was difficult. It was difficult. Um, I, I kind of questioned about my transition and just, it was just a lot, you know, I don't want to go into too much, but like, um, even though like the, uh, the, like the pregnancy, everything was good, legal matters and stuff like that. I would just leave it like that, but that's pretty much a lot. And when they do give you that, those papers and stuff like that, it has that gender, um, that she was like born as, you know, um, and, um, you know, when they talk about like, um, 
such and such, you know, uh, baby is due. And it, you know, so a lot of that stuff is a lot that they still have to go through, like the process um, yeah. of changing. Yeah. What about you tonight? Postpartum was hit. Like, I battled with a lot within my head, like, especially when it came to his bio. Like, I feel like my transition is why he don't come around. So I was just, like, really dealing with a lot in my head, like, damn, I'm really going to have to do this on my own because of me merely being trans. Like, am I going to be enough? Like, I questioned me and my transition big time just because it's like, should I just put it off until he's 18 or whatever? Just put up this facade just so that other parent is actually, like, active? Like, just with that within my head, like, made the postpartum, like, fierce. Like, what do I need to do to make sure that he has, like, both parents? Like, I was really, really, it, I think I really just got out of that, like, a couple months ago, for real, for real. I finally just said, F it. If he's here, yeah. here, I'm going to put off me and my transition or whatever just because of somebody else. Like, that, I, that within itself was what made it, like, rough as hell especially dealing with the CPS case and doing all that. Like, damn, maybe if I was just a woman for them, it'd probably be a lot better or whatever. I feel like I'll never be enough just because of me and my transition. Like, it was rough as shit. <laughs> I yeah. finally feel like I'm just now, like, really getting to, like, the end of that whole, like, postpartum, like, a month ago, maybe. Like, I've stopped really, like, beating myself up about it and oh. finally telling myself that I am enough. Things happen for a reason or whatever, but I am enough regardless of how society feels me or whatever. And I know once he's of age, he'll come to the understanding, like, I try. Yeah. Only do as much. Uh -huh. It's tough, but we getting better. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people hear about, like, postpartum depression and anxiety and all that stuff. And they think that they everybody has this idea that, oh, it's like three months after you give birth and then... After that, everybody everybody's fine, and the child is the best thing that ever happened in your life, and, and life just goes on, right? Um, I know for me, especially with Azalea, I had severe postpartum depression and anxiety and PTSD. I was extremely suicidal. And so I was trying to keep myself busy, right? And so I enrolled in school, and I was working, and I remember, like, there would be times when I would be like standing at the train station, right? Just standing there, waiting for the train to come and the train would be coming. And you would be like, you really could just step in front of that. And it would be like this voice in the back of my head telling me to step in front of this train. And I would have to be fighting this voice. Like it felt like something outside of me was telling me to end my life. And I didn't question my transition. I did have a lot of identity crisis though. Like I shaved my head, I shaved my face, I dyed my hair blue. I went through so many different identities because I felt like I didn't know who I was anymore. Um, not in my manhood, just as, just as who I was. And it took me, and the other part that I struggled with heavy was connecting with my child. Like I knew she was my child, right? I can acknowledge her as my child, but I felt more like a caregiver than a parent. Like, I felt more, when I was alone with her, I felt more like a babysitter than a dad, right? right? And I wanted to do anything I could to not be in the same house with her because every time she cried or anything, it felt I felt it under my fingernails. I felt it under my fingernails and, like, I, my whole body would go into anxiety. So I wanted to peel out of my skin. And there's the guilt that goes along with that, which is you're supposed to, to immediately see your baby and be like, oh my God, my life is fulfilled. And I just couldn't even imagine. And I didn't feel that until she, uh, I was, so she was like two. Mm -hmm. It took me two years to get out of my postpartum depression. A lot mm -hmm. of that had to do with the experience that I had in the hospital. Um, and that's just the way the mind worked. But I also didn't have any like, support did you my experience was you know you're when you're pregnant you're in the doctor office all the time people are checking on you you have all this it feels like after you have the baby you're just on your own does that, mm -hmm. is that does that seem to be y'all's experience as well um yes and no like out here in the real world yeah but like my support was big on social media like 
Right. They were on me. They were calling me. They were messaging me. Like that was my support, and yeah. that's why I always go live and all that. Like they are the my biggest help of getting out of the like depression, all that. Mm -hmm. Was like, or at least helping me put that facade on. Like, okay, we got it. Like, I would off top go on live, and then I put that facade on. Like, everything's all right, and that's what that was my support. That's what kept pushing me or whatever. And then just like, but out here, no, it was just me myself <laughs> and I trying to figure it out. But um, I I met um more medically than than oh. than familial like what i'm talking I, I guess my focus is more or less on like the medical system and how they fail us in our postpartum spaces yeah um they just kind of leave you to your vices they don't they they, they barely even give you any any fucking resources to be honest with you like it's just kind of like okay go home with this baby because that's all right you no know? I, I've seen them over there checking out this other lady that just had a baby. She get a whole little rundown of what she should do or what she shouldn't do, how postpartum be. They didn't tell me nothing. All they had is this CPS lady in my face. But other than that, they didn't give me no rundown of nothing. The lactation consultant sucked. Like, yeah. nothing. <laughs> once they once they had got this painted picture that I was just on some sort of drugs and I'm a trans man, I'm just a loony bin. Yeah. So they didn't mm. me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, New York City has that you have to watch a video with SIDS. There's actually multiple different videos. And then a lady comes in and you sign this paperwork that you actually watch these videos. So you want to know what's funny? I, I gave birth in New York City. I didn't have to watch a video. I didn't get a video. I didn't get anything. What I did get was um, somebody from the Department of Health calling me, misgendering me multiple times. Um basically like hey do you need anything and i'm like i get no okay well we'll call you in about a year okay that's what my experience was in new york city so that goes to show how as Hospital. as a unit there's not there's no synchronicity across the board it doesn't matter it's really an individual experience and that's where the problem lies too right you know and and the the little two checkups that you have after you had the baby, like this lady was in there in their hour. All they did was press my stomach and say, "Okay, you're good." And yeah. then sit away five minutes. Yeah, what? I did, I barely got. I don't even think I got a checkup. They said every checkup were, after I had my kids was for my kids. They weren't for me. Yeah, they wow. they had me go to two different checkups. One was like right after, and then a couple weeks later. But it was they're very adamant about do you need birth control. And then they press on my stomach to just to make sure, and then that was about it. Um, they was they did offer me birth control. That's a whole different story. Why I took it out. Um, my appointments they do press on your stomach, and then I had to do this questionnaire to see like if you were depressed or going through stuff. Um, luckily, one of the um, doctors was actually there at birth. I don't remember so many people coming that room when the baby is delivered, and you're out of it you know mm -hmm. so it wasn't too bad but you're right it's not enough um it's not enough um like it's not enough help out there for postpartum you know mm -hmm. um they do say it can last to five years mm -hmm. untreated yeah yeah um so let's talk about it. you kind of touched on this mari uh, birth certificates so on both of my kids uh, birth certificates i'm listed as the mother um, I did, uh, with, with Journey, get offered to be listed as the father with her other dad also being list, listed as the father. However, it was going to be this whole long process. Like, it was going to be a whole thing. And they were, like, I just didn't, I didn't feel trusting of the hospital or vital records or any of that to handle it correctly. So I was like, just put me down as mother. It's fine. I know who right. I am. So for me, that piece of paper means nothing to me. Like, I don't, even when I have to give the, the paperwork um, to different people, I never really have any issues. Um, what has been your experience? We'll start with you, Tanias, um, with your birth certificate. How are you listed if you're comfortable? Only if you're comfortable. Um, how are you listed? And like, have you had any kind of like pushback because of it? So I'm listed as as the mom, 
and every single time I sign them up for PD, pediatrics or just anything, they, well, I'm looking for his mom. And then I tell them like a million times, like, it's me, I'm the mom. No, I'm looking for his mom. I'm like, bro, it's me. I'm listed as the mom on there. And then they get to side eye and it, rolling their eyes. Like, again, I am looking for his mom. This is what I, when I first sent him to the doc or took him to the doctor when we got out of the hospital, I'm like, bro, it's me. I just snatched up my shirt at this point. I have a whole C-section. He came up out of me. I'm listed as the mom. Do I have to, what, what more do I have to show you? You shouldn't have to do that. That's so they, crazy and demeaning. They went to the, this man up here is saying that uh, he's the mom and blase, blase. Like, they made a huge ordeal about it. And they're like, are you, are you needing help filling out the paperwork? We are needing his mom and the dad or whatever. And I, I'm i telling like, them, I'm like, what? what do you need me to say? I've done shows you everything. Like, it's me. I, I I got my whole idea and all at this point. Like, bro, it took me down there two hours to finally get all that paperwork situated and all that. Like, it was hell. And even to this day, well, I ended up switching to a whole nother doctor. Because the second time I went to his appointment, it was the same ordeal. Maybe at this right. point, we we just gonna go to a different doctor because I'm not. Right. Right. This is absurd. Right. It's no mm -hmm. way in hell. Even with like when I was doing his medical or whatever, I had to do a phone interview, and they're like the same thing again. We need his mom there. We, we've got to make sure we're talking to the proper person. That it's always something. I don't know if it's a Florida thing or whatever the case may be. Because I, I said, how do you know? Even if I was a cis woman. There's women that have deep voices because you're not yeah, facial hair. Right. Not, they're not even visiting. We're over the phone at this point. They're like, well, you, you, you don't sound like his mom. I'm like, how is his mom supposed to sound? And then it begs the, the question comes up of like, how many men do you have coming in your center that are claiming to give birth to where you're fighting me on this? That's crazy wow. as hell. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what about you, Mari? What's your um, experience? Um, we, well, I tried to get like the birth certificate as parent one or parent two or the birthing parent, mm -hmm. but in mm -hmm. New York city, it was just not giving that. So they're um, lying to you. I yeah. They, it, I'm underneath the mother. Um, it doesn't bother me and stuff like that because you don't have to really show your, the birth certificate, like, Hey, this and that, you know, um, it's, it's really what it is. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't really care. It's I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah. you um, I'm, I'm, you know, right. So, okay. So let's switch, um, gears real quick. So we see nowadays a lot of trans masculine pregnancies popping up all over news outlets these days. Um, yet when you see that representation, uh, you're not seeing any black trans masculine people. Uh, for example, the cover of glamor, uh, I can't think of the, the person's name, but, um, it calls to question when we're talking about representation with seahorse dads and stuff. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Like, why? What? What do you? What do you feel as somebody who has experienced birth and publicly so, and seeing people that you've never heard of, never seen, um, be gracing the cover of magazines and being touted, toted as like this, this, this. Um, leader of i guess the, the you know the, the pregnant trans men like how does that make you feel to, for the lack of representation both of you mentioned that i'm the only one that you guys ever knew of before you gave preg before you guys got pregnant so which means but i'm not the only one obviously we know that mm -hmm. now, right but like how does that make you feel now that you are in the same position who you want to go Mark, first you can go all right Okay. Um, unfortunately, we live in a a privileged white society world. I do like the fact that it is being recognized and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's like it's no diversity. Everybody's story is totally different. A lot of those people actually have like they they don't even have a story. It's just it just seems like it's roses to them mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And they're like, you know what? I should be this face. I should. And some of those people be coming from like, not even like a thousand of followers to just that one time. And they just get like 11,000 followers and stuff like that. But, um, and their merchandise, it's like, it's like, was it planned? Right. That's, it right. just seemed like it's too, 
as two in your lap like what was what was your struggle right what did right. you have to do right right besides get pregnant what about you um tonight because the only time i see us is when they're bashing us like mm -hmm. they got down upon us and look at this trans man or she is getting pregnant with a beard like this is the only time i see us other yeah. than that yt trans man they yep. they glorify they over you there on like, here this is we don't owe you shit but when it comes to us, mm -hmm. it's they, they frown upon us, and it's mm -hmm. sad because it's us tearing us down, putting yeah. us up, uh, messed up, uh, world star, and all that. It's us, and that's Very, right. All three of us have been on war star. All three of us. us. What? Yeah. All Why? three of us, and none, and yeah. none of us in in positive lights. None of us. None of us. Hey, wouldn't you want to uplift? No, <laughs> Why would they want to do that? And, and, and yeah, like for me, um, I've been, uh, my, my, my daughter is nine. She'll be 10 next year at the beginning of the next year, January. So I'm going on a decade now, right? I have always been a voice for seahorse dads. I've never stopped being a voice for seahorse dads. I've always unapologetically been a seahorse dad and it is bothersome, it's hurtful, and it's a slap in the face to have put so much work in. Every single day I'm putting in so much work. And even when it comes to followers, as petty as it sounds, I have to fight tooth and nail for followers. White people, non-black, white passing people, all they have to do is exist. And they have hundreds of thousands of followers, millions of followers. Danny the trans dad being one of them. And he knows this, we've had conversations, which is why I have no reason um, dropping his name. Danny got pregnant after me. Danny has not, and I, I don't mean no harm, done anything near what I've done for the community as far as education and stuff goes. Danny has a million followers on TikTok and hundreds of thousands of followers on, on Instagram. I'm still sitting at 60,000 on, on Instagram and 100,000 on TikTok, right? Why? Why is it that I put so much work in, I do all of this, and still I'm barely acknowledged? Why was it? Why was it? Why was it Mari on the on the on the cover of Glamour? Why was it? Why was it Tanias on the on the fucking cover of Glamour? Like and that's why I've been so adamant about like when I came across your platform and off the strength of me coming across you when I did years ago. That's why I've been very adamant about trying to like partner with you and like. Right. And with you because I think it's fucked up that right. you've been so long, and you're the first person and only person that I came about. But your platform is here. Like what I learned so much watching your platform. Yeah, and yeah. And a, a voice like and, when I, I'm sharing your post, I'm reposting you, I'm doing you because I feel like you should be way further within the platforms than me. There's no way I've only been sharing my journey for as long as I have and I'm at a million and you're where you're at. That's why I'm like, let me be that voice to be able to push you out there because maybe you, you should be gaining way more than what, what I'm gaining because you're, you're actually teaching. I really don't, I, I just share my journey. I'm not knowledgeable to where you're knowledgeable. Like you, right. you've got that voice, that knowledge to where you could teach people. I just share. That's it. Yeah. I'm just really sharing my, my, my life with it. Well, other than that, you're actually being that advocate, that voice for us. And I feel like I trade you platforms at any day just because I feel like you de you're deserving of it. Because I've, I, I, right along with other people, have been able to learn a whole hell of a lot. But that's why I do what and I do. You just to speaking of, like, um, you've gotten like a lot of attention. It's 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 no way that these magazines have not came across your platform. That's what I'm saying. You. You was actually mentioned, um, what was the governor? Even though it was not positive, you was actually mentioned and by Candace. Like people that's like, you know, hey. yes, like. Right, that's really the thing. Did. There's no, no way, way, there's no, no way, way that they haven't seen or heard of me um, right. as many times as I've gone viral. And to me, it's not even about me specifically. I'm just using me as an example because of how many times I've gone viral, because of how much. I've done for them to just keep continuously overlook black people. And it's crazy because I'm light skinned with freckles and green eyes at the very least, but I'm even talking about people that don't look like me. I want to see more people that look like y'all covering these 
on these covers, getting these interviews. I'm not understanding. And every single time that they ask <laughs> us and tell me if I'm lying, just about every single time that they ask us for, to be that representation, they want us to do it for free or for basically yeah. nothing. For free. Right. Not, not, not. That's so exploit, exploitative, exploitative, whatever the word is. It's, it, feels like a, it feels like a punch in the gut. It's like, really, you want me to put myself out there when I'm already experiencing all this negativity to further your brand, but you're not offering me shit. At all. Especially that's that my- I always tell y'all to every single time, if they don't, if they're not talking dollars, tell them to go fuck themselves. And right. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So that brings me into my next question. How do you think our lived experiences as black trans men and seahorse dads differ from that of non-black trans men and seahorse dads? Like, what do you see as, like, how do you think our experiences are different? And I can start off to, to, to kind of help y'all out. So for me, I feel like a lot of people hate the conversation surrounding systemic racism and everything like that, but it's absolutely a thing. And um, even with our conversations surrounding our uh, experiences during pregnancy medically, um, you can tell that regardless of where you are, whether you have insurance or if you're on Medicaid, our resources tend to be limited. We don't get the opportunity to um, take the time out to, to, to pick out the luxury docs, doctors who have taken the time out to learn about transness or you know travel across to the globe to a different OBGYN. Our community isn't uplifting us and raising funds for us to be able to access um, our, our resources and stuff like that. We're left to our own devices. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that despite transphobia, and despite the fact that we've given birth, we are still also black first and seen as men. Thusly, we're treated as men. And black men are, are expected to one, not have emotions and hold everything in and two, handle everything on our own with little to no help. And when we do ask for help, we're shamed for it. I watch White trans masculine people ask for help every day on this on these apps they get on here and they're they're fundraising for their bands and to to go on vacation and shit like that. But when we get on our platforms and ask for stuff, we're we're accused of begging and stealing and scamming and all of the things. Yep. That's been my experience. So now I'll start with you tonight. That's pretty much a similar thing. Like they frown upon us. We ask for any kind of help. And that's mm -hmm. why I've got so used to like it took everything in me to put that GoFundMe just because so many people you're begging and go get a job and you're the average black man living off of society and off top they think you're living off of the government because you're merely existing and being a stay at home yeah. parent they feel as if we're living off of the government no. it's very very nuts to me or like when I take my kids to like the little play places or whatever like they all looking at me like. It's a black man, get alone a man with a child. Like they're in awe or yeah. they're in public when I'm really just going grocery shopping. Like yeah. shop. They will just, clap. They will clap for you. Yes. Yes. Oh my yes. God. We, we, we see a black person with a kid like they're in mm -hmm. awe. They talk about where's it. your mommy? Where's that's their first thing is where's your mom? Where's your mom? Right. What? When, what was I doing? I can't remember. But is his mom around? I'm like, why does he have to have yeah. a mom? Like, right. often, always ask, like, oh, my God, that's so cute to see a father with their kid. And try having girls because, you know, I know how to do hair. My my uh, my other co-parents know how to do hair. Oh, your hair looks so beautiful. Did your mommy do it? And my kids are like, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> like, who that? Um, so what about you, uh, Mari? What do, what do you think as far as, like, the differences in experiences? Um, like, I have to go back to what Tanias was saying. They actually do clap. They ask where the mother is and stuff like that. Um, it's like they expect a mother figure or the child has to have a mother figure. Granted, my child does have, have a mother, but at the same time, how society view that as. And just really, like, a lot of people just feel like like African Americans are like like deadbeat and like 
we just don't take care of our children is so crazy. Like the stigma that you have as a black person. And you got to wonder, do they, I, I've never, ever seen anybody walk up to a white man and say, well, where's your mommy at? I've never right. seen it happen. Have y'all? Or am I bugging? No, no I haven't. I, I just haven't. want to make sure that it wasn't just me because it's, you know. So um, many people say that men can't give birth. So we know that um, Tanias had to unlearn some, some, some stigmas and things of that nature. Um, so now, um, what do you feel when people are like, you're a woman, men can't give birth. What, how do you, how does that make you feel? And honestly, be a thousand percent. How does that make you feel, uh, Mari? Um, <laughs> um, honestly, I feel like, like some of those people, you just cannot change their mind. It's like beating a dead horse. Okay. You know, um, you have to pick your battles. I can put the information out there. If you choose to, whatever you decide to do with it, that's fine. But keep that negative over there. And also, any op opinion that you have, you do not have to speak. I don't care if somebody agree with my lifestyle, like my lifestyle. I don't care. But I feel like respect should definitely be gone. Like, it, it gives nothing to show somebody respect. Right. What about you tonight? That's like the post I saw a couple of days ago or whatever, when he another trans man bashed another one. I, I sat there, I was like, damn, I was that individual that used to think like that. And I can't realization, I would never be a cis man. So I'm not yes. going to live and act as if I'm a cis man. I've right, got right. these people, I'm going to go ahead and use it. If you view me, however you view me, I don't give a damn. I've got these parts. I know for a damn sure I cannot get no woman pregnant. Right. So I'm not right. running around society acting as if I'm a fucking cis man, because I'm not. Right. right. Since I've got these parts, I'm going to go ahead and use it. You yes. can see whatever the hell you want to, but baby, I, I can't get you pregnant. And one thing I refuse to continue to do is be anybody's step daddy. I refuse, because right. I refuse to right. right. kids and they just snatch them away. So the fact mm -hmm. that I give birth to my kid that can't nobody take means the world to me, and I don't give a damn how you feel about me. Right. That's Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> Yeah, you can't take mine. Right, and to, and, and to piggyback off of that, to piggyback off of that, I think that um, when you're saying when people say you'll never be a man, you're not a man. Um, they're saying you won't. You're not. You're not a cisgender man. And to that, I say, great. I didn't ever expect to be. I don't want to be. Um, cis men are not the not anything to aspire to be and, and it really bothers me when it comes from women because i'm like you're talking about the same cis men that you guys have to use the buddy system to walk down a, a dark street from because you might get um sexually assaulted you're talking about the, the same cis men who have multiple babies that they don't take care of are you talking about those same cis men i don't aspire to be that um and also like the thing about it is it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's no different than if you like tomatoes and I don't like tomatoes. That doesn't mean that when you're at your dinner table, I need to walk up to you and say, radishes are A1, tomatoes are nasty. Like, why do you feel like you need to say that to me? And that's the thing. People are like, I'm not transphobic. I don't hate trans people. Yes, you do. Because you, you feel do. the need to voice. Your opinion is yours to have. Don't really give a shit. But when you feel the need to voice that, what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to be hurtful. You're trying to be a bully. You're trying to bring somebody down. You're trying to diminish somebody's identity. And but why? That says so much more about you than it does to any that, that, that it does about me or anybody else who's trans. Um, so that brings me to I think this is a good segue into this next question. What is one misconception that people have about seahorse dads that you'd like to address? I'll go first. Okay. One misconception that people have about trans men as a whole is that when we transition, in order for us to transition, we have to hate everything feminine and we have to kill, murder, just forget about the fact that we were assigned female at birth, which mm -hmm. is contradicting as fuck because then you turn around and try to remind me all the time that I was assigned female at birth. Right? right? So they're like, but why would you, kind of like Tanias was saying he felt before, why would you transition? Why would you transition um, and then have a baby? That's the most feminine thing you can do. Right. But it's like trans, 
I think people just need to let go of this idea that every trans person has the same end, end goal and everybody's uh, journey <laughs> is the same. So like Tanaya said, um, I have these body parts. They're like, real men don't want to have babies. No, 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 no. Cisgender men don't have the option to. I am lucky enough to where I am immersed in cisgender gay culture. And I know so many cisgender men that would die to have their own baby with their partner. And if right. they had the parts, they absolutely would do it. So to tell me that I'm not a real man just because I have different parts is crazy as hell. And to say that I need to let go of everything feminine, I get told all the time, well, you, you're, you're a man, you look like a man, but you still have feminine mannerisms. You've never met a feminine man. Oh, but, but you're supposed to be masculine. No, I'm not. So this idea, this misconception that um, we're supposed to like let go of or, mm. or, or banish everything feminine or female uh, centered is crazy and absurd. And it's right. not realistic because femininity exists in everyone. Exactly. Um, Tanias, I'll let you go first. Uh, a lot of people like me, for instance, or whatever, yeah. felt as if, because so much of my life I grew up liking women or whatever. And then when I transitioned, it's like, I felt as if I needed to continue liking women. And it's it's frowned upon if I were exploring and all this and that. Hence the reason why I felt in my head when I found out I was pregnant, because again, I was worried about what people were going to think like, you transition and now you're dealing with men type of thing, not realizing that a lot of people, they end up, yeah, they were liking women prior to transitioning, but once they transition, they've gotten comfortable, confident within their self and started exploring other things. And I had seen a post way back then, like I will never understand why a trans man was against, or when they were a stud, they were against being with men, but now they're transitioning and now they're with a man, like that's fake and blase, blase. Like a lot of people are under the impression that since you transition, you be with a woman or you being with men, that's just frowned upon, thinking that sexuality and gender are one thing when it's not. Like, not but, acknowledging uh, that that it's, it's okay for cisgender people to have different sexualities, but not trans people. Right. Right. That's crazy. <laughs> what about you, Mari? Um, I want to put this out there, and this is for like the cisgender people that may wa like watch this that trans men are not trying to erase motherhood. I feel like putting seahorse dads in like the birthing um, bubble, it's just, it's, it's enough to share the experience because right. we have it's not a pie. those, right, we have those parts, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like I have to be either or, and that's still fine if somebody do not want to classify themselves as that. Um, to go off what Tanaya said, like to be like this, like a uh, masculine person, and then after you transition and stuff like that, you know, they expect they don't just expect you to just mess with the same gender. They expect you to have mess with the same genitalia too. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I actually, um, you know, I'm dating women, and like my partner is a trans woman. We have two children together and at the same time that I still will be frowned upon because she has what she has mm -hmm. you know and because so, of the um, that you that you conceived your children right exactly. and that's not man right. you know what's yeah. crazy though a cisgender gay man who's a bottom nobody's calling him a woman and telling right. him that that's that he's not a man but trans men we can't receive anything we're just supposed to trap it up we're never supposed to, like no orgasms for us i guess like that's crazy as hell right like what um okay so this is the last question um have you experienced hate from within the community have i yes <laughs> man y'all know not to play with me that'd be the Seriously. biggest it'd be the biggest critics like it's, it blows my mind but they're the biggest critics you're making the rest of us look bad you should not be transitioning and having a baby. You should you should not be doing the most woman thing. And since you've had a baby, I'm gonna call you she and blase blase. Like they become yeah. a hard boy. Like damn. Yeah. Um, and, and we're if you think it's bad now, imagine nine, ten years ago. Um, you know there wasn't there wasn't black gay trans men. There weren't black bi 
I'm trans now. There were everybody was straight. Somehow everybody was or in the closet. Straight, but, or yeah. Somebody everybody was getting dick, but they were straight, right? And so to be openly so, I had people, other trans men wanted to fight me. They threatened to jump me. They didn't know me. They just wanted to jump me. Um, when I when I had my when I when I came out as gay one, um, I was in the ballroom scene. I was getting chopped from the back of the runway just because I was gay, not because I didn't look the part or anything, but because I was gay. Um, when I when I had my kids, I was told that from in the community that I had my kids for clout. I got my kids to go viral. I had I had kids that I'm going to be tethered to for the rest of my life for some fucking likes on social media. That's why I had my kids. That's what um, they... Th I had people from within the community spreading um, rumors about having me having STIs just because I sleep with men. Like, it's been... I tell people all the time that being a part of community is not the same as being in community. And right. just because we're all trans men or trans people does not mean that we suddenly have this sense of kumbaya, let's hold hands and, and fight the power together, which is why I keep myself so removed um, from the community. I will always fight for the community, but I've just gotten so much hate for it. And right. I always tell these people, I, I crawled and got beat up along the way so that y'all could walk. Like, it was me. I was the person that came out and, and, and knocked down all these walls and things, right? Um, the other question was about um, internalized transphobia, but we already talked about that. So is there anything, I know uh, Q, I'm not even sure if Q is still in here, but Q did ask a question and that question was, um, were you nervous about going into public settings when your stomach started to show? This is for all of us. So we can start with uh, Tinnitus. Uh, yes, I was. Um, in the very beginning, but that was before my stomach was even thrown. It's like, damn, what am I going to do? It's mm -hmm. about to be hot as hell outside. I'm in Florida. There's no way I could just cover this up. But mm -hmm. that was before I even got bigger. But being on like the platform or whatever, I'd ended up getting traction or whatnot. And a lot of people would approach me in public and say, oh my gosh, you're this and all that. So once I've gotten, got to that spot where I was big, I just said F it. Mm -hmm. A lot of, I, I haven't had anybody come approach me in no ill ill intent or nothing like that so being that i had all the people approaching me in a positive light and uh -huh. pity when i got bigger like yeah. nobody even approach me in no ill manner so why should i even bother or think that it's going to be bad now right. so I, that's what made it a little bit easier when i did approach it because i gained 100 pounds so there was no me hiding it at all 100 pounds where i was 200 pounds by the time i gave, gave birth to this baby i was 100 at at the beginning and 200 at the end that's so, nuts. There was, there was no hiding it at all, but right. that I had great people coming to me saying uh -huh. like positive stuff when it, I approached that big stage, which was like t three months after I found out I was pregnant. It's like bump it, right? We, we go right. walking up and down the subway, all that. People would just blow their horn and just throw their thumb up, and it, it made yeah. it a little bit easier, I guess. Now, Mari, I already know this. Um, I know all yeah. your business, but um, yeah. <laughs> What about you? Um, I totally felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it's the pair. You know, I, I feel like once I got closer to the ending, I was thinking, God, I'm like, God, yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, uh, it just comes with being pregnant. You just, you're going to have a belly pregnant. I don't <laughs> yeah. care. It, everybody has a belly pregnant. Yeah. So I mean, it's just, it's just it. what it is. I, I was up there. How long ago was that that I was up there? A few months ago, I went up to. New was York. it really two months? It was. It was like two or three months ago, actually. Um, you know. <laughs> and I went up there, and Mari was barely even showing, like barely. And, I feel like I'm. <laughs> and we went to go go for a walk to go get some food, and he was like, "Oh my god, my stomach!" I was like, "Mari, you don't have a stomach. Like, where? Is your stomach <laughs> where? Like, it was not even no stomach it was there." Like, it looked like he ate a little bit too much and he was full, but he was like, <laughs> and you know, I, you know, sometimes for me, it's so, I, you know, you forget that people have such different experiences with their body because for me, I just walked outside, but again, I've always been fat. So like, for me, it's like, 
okay, you just have a big stomach. Like, again, I had to, I remember um, one, so I also brought y'all faux locks, but we're not going to go into that. I got faux locks with my first pregnancy before faux locks was a big thing, right? And I was feeling myself and I went to the beauty supply store to get one of those Marley, you know, those netted, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I went there and I remember I couldn't find it. So I went to the lady and I asked her like, hey, you know, where can I find this? And she was walking. She goes, look at that big old stomach. And I was like, yes, yeah, because I'm pregnant. She was like, boy, stop. <laughs> and I was like, no, seriously. And she did not believe me. So for me, my experience was so much different, but it's because I'm not small framed to begin with. So me having a stomach doesn't, it doesn't look out of place. I look more out of place skinny than I do with the stomach, if that makes I, sense. I was more worried about my top half than my stomach and my stomach was bigger than my, bigger than my chest was. I don't know. I just, I think it was mentally because I knew yeah. it was still be there. After it's a I, mental thing. It is. That's a mental. Like, it is. We all have, that's what I mean. Like we all have different relationships with our body justly like what we would pay attention to. I was more dysphoric about my nose spreading across my face than I was about my stomach or anything else like that. Like mm-hmm. my nose was like all the, like, <laughs> that just I all the way that. across my face like this. I hate that part. Yours comes in your cheeks. My whole face was fat as shit. It was I very <laughs> <laughs> All right. So oh my God. I want to thank you both for taking the time out to do this. Um, we can just let everybody know where to find you. So if they want more information, uh, remember, and I said it, that none of these people that you see up here are doing free labor for you. So if you have a question or anything, make sure you have cash apps or Venmos or sales or something available because we are all full-time parents and we all have um things that we're all going through in life as well so to answer your question is taking time either away from our kids or something else that we could be doing even if it's sitting on our couch scratching our butt cheeks that's our time for ourselves right so uh mari what uh where can people find you give them your uh, Um, top and your um instagram my instagram is uh mari pen yeah i'm I'm good yeah Um, mari pen griffey underscore um tiktok but it's my TikTok, y'all. It's also Mari Pen Griffey, I think. These Mari are... Pen Griffey, yes. You can find me or you can just Stop. search pregnant man and trust me, I will pop <laughs> up. And these gentlemen will pop up as well. It's Mari. Zizi, knock it off. Have okay. kids. No, it's not Mari Pen Griffey. It's Chen Griffey 93. You're shocked. Oh, yeah. Pen Griffey 93. Pen Griffey 93. And Tanias. I hope when y'all hear this baby screaming in the background, this is your birth control. But mine, <laughs> mine is Trans King Thirty on YouTube and TikTok and IG. It's all trans the board. And for me, it's Caden X official, also all across the board. Um, so again, thank y'all and have the day you deserve. <laughs>